midfield. Leeds Rhinos are defending their crown. And what a moment for Halifax Rugby League. Austin oh. is through and Warrington dominating. Great try for the Rollins. And as the Giants take the points home. And this is a poor lad. Well, good evening and welcome to The Last Tackle, our weekly rugby league show. What a week of news it's been in the rugby league world. We're going to try and unpick some of that over the next half hour or so. Delighted to be joined by rugby league journalist Gareth Walker. And Gareth, quite a busy week, I'd imagine, for you from sort of Thursday onwards. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the minute that that news dropped in on Thursday morning that Australia and New Zealand were withdrawing from the World Cup, I think for the next 48 hours after that, especially in newspaper world, it, everything was was to do with that and getting reactions from it. Uh, there was obviously a huge amount of initial disappointment when that was announced. I think there was some anger after that, you know, both on you know the actual decision, but the way it was handled as well went down particularly badly. And then when it emerged that the players hadn't been consulted uh, and that they were wanting to play a lot of them, you know, high profile players saying they wanted to play, that added another layer to what's becoming a complex story. And, it, and it's going to carry on until we get a resolution, which is what the World Cup guys are, are working on at the moment. That, for me, you mentioned it was the kind of craziest part in all of this, was that there seemed to have been little or no consultation with the players who were going to be most affected by this, of course, the ones that are going to be at the centre of it all. And as you mentioned, it seemed like quite a few of them wanted to play. I, <laughs> I'm generally not part of the tin hat brigade in rugby league. I'm not a big conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but there does seem to be more at play here than just concerns about COVID. There definitely does seem to be some influence from some NRL clubs who, who don't want to see the beginning of their season affected and want to just bubble wrap players once the grand final finishes in, in October. Yeah, I think that much is clear, Lewis. I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, the NRL clubs have definitely flexed their muscles over this and for them not to consult the players when... The players over there have that powerful Rugby League Players Association. You know, they have a collective voice and have, have shaped a lot of policy in Australia, including this eight-week break between the seasons. For them not to be consulted is, is fairly remarkable, really. And then when the guys came out and said that they wanted to play, I think that's embarrassing for the Australian and New Zealand committees, really. I think, you know, if any individual player would have said, I don't want to travel over there, I, you know, I've been in a bubble for months, I want to spend time with my family... I don't think there'd be anybody anywhere that would have an issue with that, but there will be players that want to play and to have not consulted them before coming to this decision and then given World Cup officials four minutes notice before dropping it on the world. I think, was, I think it was disrespectful and arrogant. I've heard those, used words, those words used and, and I think that's right. You know, the people involved in the World Cup, some of them have, have virtually dedicated their lives to making a success of this competition since it was announced that England would be staging it. And to behave in that manner, it, it wasn't a good look for the sports. It wasn't fair on the World Cup organisers and it wasn't fair on the players either. And there are obvious risks involved. Everyone knows we're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic and that has to be taken into account. But at the same time, it seems odd that when the World Cup is scheduled, the Australian Rugby Union team are due to be in England. They've got an Olympics team out in Japan at the moment. There was an extensive package put towards the Australian and New Zealand boards of quarantine measures, mitigating measures put in place to make this tournament as safe as possible. A huge amount of money has gone into that and was going to go into that. It just seems slightly odd that when every other sport seems to be managing it, rugby league again is shutting itself down. Yeah, and people have seen through that argument straight away, I think, haven't they? I mean, I've seen that document and it's unbelievably comprehensive and it's hard to believe that there would be anything much else that they could do, you know, to protect the players over here. You know, I've spoken to people who'd seen the Olympic policy as well, and they said that the Rugby League World Cup one compared favourably and in some cases better than the Olympic one. So I don't think people would were necessarily buying that player welfare thing straight away. As I mentioned, you know, if, if individual players had put their hands up and said, look, I don't want to travel because of the situation in the UK or because they've been in a bubble for a long time, you know, it's very different to Super League, what the NRL players are doing over there, they're sacrificing things already. But if the players want to play and want to come over and haven't been consulted, that just doesn't seem right. 
And this is obviously a live and developing story all the time. And just to break the fourth wall a little bit, we're recording this about midday. It goes out at seven. So who knows what's going to happen in the interim? We could have we could have a whole new story on our hands. But it doesn't seem at the moment like the decision is going to change. I think we have to accept that if we do have a World Cup this year, it is without the kangaroos and the kiwis in that kind of official guise. There's plenty of alternatives that have been offered up. One of the ones that really interests me is one that was kind of muted by the likes of Blake Ferguson on Twitter for, for the Aboriginal and the Maori teams to, to get together and take their place. And if that is a feasible alternative and something that happens, that would be an incredible uh, moment for the World Cup in, in terms of what it would mean culturally, but also we'd still see some of the best players in the world coming over. It would, yeah. I mean, I can see both sides of this. I've heard players say, you know, if, if it isn't the full strength Australia and New Zealand team, then there'll always be an asterisk against the competition. It might not mean as much to win it. But these are unique times. You know, how many times have we said that over the last two years? And, and sometimes you have to do things that are a bit out of the box. Now, can you imagine the, the response that those Australian Indigenous and New Zealand Maori teams will get over here? They'd be cheered like heroes. You know, you would never get Australian New Zealand teams get a reaction like they would do if that did happen. Whether or not that's the right thing to do, I'm not fully sure myself yet, but I think, as you mentioned, culturally, um, certainly in terms of the reaction they get over here and in terms of some of those players are the best players in the world that would be in the, the full-strength Australia and New Zealand teams. It's certainly worth a discussion at the very least. And, and if that was to happen, you know, we've got to look at the positive side of it. It would add a dimension to a World Cup that, you know, hadn't happened before. We, we have had the New Zealand Maori team, haven't we, in 2000, but not an Indigenous Australian team. You know, if they come over and, and we see the kind of scenes we see before the All-Stars match in the NRL at the start of every season, it could be terrific. But my understanding is, is that that concept is genuinely being explored as a possibility. I, I, I don't know any more than that, whether it's likely to happen or not. A couple of other alternatives. I know the USA have put their hand up and Serbia have put their hand up to say that they could play last minute. And with all due respect to those those nations, it is not going to be the same as it is if Australia and New Zealand were there. And then obviously the 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 kind of one that the Australians are pushing us towards is to postpone it. But the big issue there is that you then run into the football world cup and there would be, if you copy and pasted the schedule to so 12 months' time, there would be 10 days overlap, and that causes all sorts of problems. It does broadcast wise, I think, doesn't it? You know, the BBC have committed to, uh, you know, a beyond anything that we've had before broadcasting deals. So that's so much of these tournaments. And, and we should say at this point, you know, we're not just talking about the men's hour, you know, it's the women's tournament, the wheelchair tournament, the coverage that those competitions are going to get if it's staged this year is absolutely phenomenal for them and groundbreaking. And that has to be part of the discussion here. It's not just as straightforward as put it to next year, because as you say, there's that overlap. It could affect how much um, commercially the tournament can can attract because of the broadcast. All that is part of a discussion. It's not a straightforward thing. And, you know, I really do feel for the World Cup guys because they've been almost exemplary with everything they've done in terms of, you know, promotion, organisation, the way they've done everything so far. It's been absolutely immaculate. Uh, and to have this thrown at them now it is really tough on them. And, and they have to find you know, whatever they do is almost certainly going to be an imperfect solution to an imperfect situation. Uh, and it, it's tough on them and it, it's hard after they've put so much into it so far already. And you mentioned the, the women in the wheelchair competitions as well. It's almost those guys that I feel the most sorry for in all of this because they're inevitably going to feel the knock-on of effect of what happens in the men's competition. And that's why I find it slightly strange. One of the arguments about Australia not coming over is that they've been in the bubble for two years. Well, the women's team and the wheelchair team haven't, and yet they're still not sending them. But if you speak to the likes of Emily Rudd, Jody Cunningham, Tom Coyd and the wheelchair team, some of those guys who have been working so hard for the last well, a few years, two, three years to get to this point, a real sucker punch for them, knowing the ramifications of what might happen here. Absolutely. this is, And this is the, the crux of the whole argument. Obviously, the best players are in the NRL and, and a lot of them play for Australia and New Zealand. But th this argument goes way beyond that number of players who pull on the kangaroos and the Kiwi shirt into the rest of the men's tournament and into two other tournaments. You know, the World Cup had rightly made so much of the fact that these competitions would run concurrently. We're going to finish with a, a fantastic double header at Old Trafford. The wheelchair tournament would have had exposure beyond anything it's done before. 
all these people are part of this discussion and this argument. It's not just about the relative handful of guys that run out for Australia and New Zealand, although they obviously are important to this competition. It's a more complex and it's a wider argument than, than even that. And even within the men's competition, you take a look at Greece, for example, who were having to train and play in the middle of the night because rugby league is not a recognised sport in Greece. They overcame so many hurdles. Jamaica making their first World Cup and the, the work that they've gone into this. It's just everything has just been pulled up from the roots with this. And obviously we're speaking at a time where no official decision has been made. I get the impression that they are leaning towards playing it anyway, but I mean, I don't know. That's instinct. So it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking for some of these teams involved. It is, yeah. And, and I mean, I, even having said everything I've said, I still can't make my mind up what the best thing to do is. is it no, and I, I'm, I'm exactly the same as you, Gareth. There doesn't seem to be a, the, well, the, the only right solution to this is for Australia and New Zealand to change their mind. They're not going to do that. So I don't know where we go from here. No, I, but what I would say is if it does go ahead this year, if the tournament organisers decide that's what happens, then, you know, as a sport in this country, we've got a huge amount you know, a huge part to play then in making sure the Jamaican and the Greece stories are told. If we get an Australian Indigenous team and a New Zealand Maori team, they've got to be shouted from the rooftops the commitment that they've done and we have got to make the best of it and make it, you know, a groundbreaking World Cup even without those two nations. Now, that might not happen, but if it does, everyone's going to have a big part to play over here in trying to get behind it because I think it really has annoyed a lot of people in this country you know, not, not just media and officials and, and players, and but supporters, you know, I've had supporters contacting me saying they've spent hundreds of pounds on tickets and feel they've just been disregarded by two governing bodies on the other side of the world. Uh, everybody's going to have a huge part to play if it goes ahead this year. And it, it's going to be interesting to see what that decision is because it's not a straightforward one. And this, in some respects, this sits as part of a much wider conversation about international rugby league in general, because we, we've barely seen international rugby league since well the 2017 world cup there was the the great britain tour and this is men's the women have been quite active in in touring but we obviously had the great britain tour in 2019 and uh, we had a, a, a series against new zealand in 2018 but in comparison to what other sports are doing and you do have to make that comparison because you're all fishing out the same pond it's just it's, it's the bare minimum it has to get better doesn't it but this decision just seems to sum up what the attitude towards international rugby league is in some parts of the world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I've seen, I mean, Jamie Peacock did in our column in, in the mirror, that the argument that you press ahead this year and if you make the best of it without them, and we have a fantastic sellout tournament over here that creates stars and stories, all of a sudden that power that these two countries have had for so long might be taken back away from them to an extent. And I can see that argument as well. It's a gamble, isn't it? And if you go into a World Cup without two of you, your three biggest nations, that is a gamble. But if it happens and the tournament organisers organizers make a big success of it, then that could shift the whole dynamic of international rugby league. And the other factor in this as well is that, obviously, with international eligibility rules, we could see arguably the best player in the world at the moment, James Tedesco, lining up for Italy. And there's plenty of other cases where that could be the case because of dual nationality and dual registration and stuff like that. So... It could be a, a wonderful opportunity for some of those, those nations to, to make real big strides forward. It could be, yeah. And Tedesco played in the last two World Cups for Italy, doesn't it? So it's not as ridiculous as it sounds, but I think it does absolutely shatter this whole player welfare stance that they've made over there because James Tedesco isn't any safer in an Italian jersey than he is in an Australian jersey. Uh, and while I absolutely do not blame any player that does that, I think fair play to them. If you want to play, get over here. I think it makes an absolute mockery of the Australian and New Zealand stance if that happens and, and, and generally isn't great for the sport in, in that sense. You know, it'd be great if some of those countries would have strong teams. I'd, I'd love that. Fantastic. Um, but it then it, it just completely embarrasses that decision that the Australians and New Zealand have made if those players come over anyway and just wear a different shirt. Well, it's going to rumble on this, isn't it, for, for some time. And I think even once we get a decision, it's going to rumble on. I think for a lot of people... Uh, th this won't be finished until that first ball is kicked at the first game of the World Cup, whenever, wherever that may be. Uh, let's just move on then to what's happening a little bit closer to home domestically. And it's been a few interesting stories coming out of Super League at the moment. One that's broken today is um, Kevin Sinfield bringing his time at Leeds Rhinos to an end earlier than expected. His role with the club will finish this weekend. And 
But there'll be a lot said about what Leeds have achieved in the last few years or haven't achieved, so to speak. But there can't be any questions or doubts about the legacy that that man will leave that club. No, and I hope and I expect that he gets a complete hero's send-off on, on Sunday. You know, kind of pinning the decision around a game allows the club to say goodbye to him properly. And I think that's really important and very typically leads in, in how good and how well they've managed that. Um, you know, I read his quotes today in the, in the statement saying that his main objective when he came back was to leave them in a better place than, than when he came into that director of rugby thing. And I don't think you could argue against that when you see what he came into at the time when they were they were fighting against relegation. They've had to completely reshape the squad uh, salary cap wise. And, you know, they've made some exciting signings for next season in Caesar and James Bentley, retained Matt Pryor, you know, brought Luke Gale and players like that to the club. I think they are in a much better position there. I think they're on the cusp. You know, they've got some great young players coming through as well, which has always been a hallmark of, of successful Leeds teams. So I think he has put them in a better position than when he arrived. He has had some rocky times, obviously, during that. Um, but I hope he gets cheered from the rafters on Sunday. And I hope we still see him in and around Rugby League, even though he's obviously moving over to Rugby Union. And I guess he'll be revered and remembered as well for as much as what you've done away from rugby. I, as a Rugby League fan, as a Rugby League person, I can't recall feeling much prouder than in November or December, whenever it was when he did his seven marathons and the the awareness and the money that he raised for his mate Rob Burrow and, and MND as a as a wider issue was just incredible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is sport and you will always have critics about what goes on in sport. On decisions that you make to do with players and things like that. But that just illustrated his character as a person, didn't it? You know, it, it took him to an audience well beyond rugby league uh, and made him like a, a national hero. The media coverage that he got for that and, and the help that that would have done for the Motor Neuro Disease Association and Rob Burrow and his family is immeasurable. So, you know, whatever anybody thinks about stuff that's happened in rugby, you know, what he's done away from the field shows exactly what kind of person he is and why he should be a rugby league hero, you know, forever, basically. Yeah, an absolute legend of the game. And throughout this season, throughout this series of The Last Tackle, we've been looking back at some of the game's greatest players in our Rugby League GOATS series. And this week, we're taking a look at the career of the brilliant Kieran Cunningham. I was fortunate to do something that I loved. I was good at it. I managed to rub shoulders with some of the greatest players in the world who I idolised. Working class family. Dad worked for Pilks Local. Um, never used to have a TV, just a coal fire. And you know, I think my mum was a bit of a rabbit and away we went, 10 of them. I was last of 10. So there was an even split, five girls, five boys. Um, already probably the most successful of, of the, the other two. He, he played for Great Britain, Wigan, Leeds, St. Helens, everybody, Challenge Cups, won a Lance Todd. Um, brother Tommy played for Warrington, St. Helens, and uh, played for Wales. And, my brother Ian actually signed for Witness, um, and my brother Steve actually played for Swinton, so to some extent we all sort of played a bit of professional rugby league. I played for St Helens Crusaders as a kid up to about 10, and I was a, I was a decent player, but I lost my dad when I was 10 and I didn't really have that sort of father figure in my life, and sort of it's a bit of a rebellious streak for a few years, and went off the rails as a junior, and you know, it's tough for the mum, single single mum trying to look after me and and uh, I sort of came back round again and there was a kid called Warren Barra who actually signed for Wigan Warren and Warren was my vehicle so he picked me up and took me everywhere and um, so that was me, Oral St James at 13 and I went to Wigan St Jude's for the last year but Saints was always in the background and to be fair you know, I think if Saints would have come in and offered me a t-shirt to sign I would have done that and it was a t-shirt plus a bag of crisp I think I signed for in the end. I came in in 94, which, you know, we had a great side, you know, you know, your Tira parties, your Shane Coopers, you, you, you go through, you know, played with idols who had idolised, you know, my favourite player of all time was Phil Vives, and all those people that I'd watched on the terrace that, and idolised them, and then made me want to play the game of rugby league. Um, you know, I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to rub shoulders with them and associate with them and call them friends. It's a perfect day, conditions superb for the Super League. And we've been saying for a while, this is what it's all about. And this is what it's all about. As Cunningham 
one of the greatest people I've ever sort of dealt with him and coached with and I respect highly is Eric Hughes and Eric was at the club and you know and Eric you know Eric really gave me a shot and he could see the potential in me and he, he gave me much the opportunity and chance and 96 we just hit the ground running and that was for me that was the start of that young squad with a dash of real good senior players that was the start of something special for this club. Saints have won it. Saints have won back-to-back -back titles for the first time in 30 years. There was lots of opportunities to go elsewhere. Lots. I mean, I was I was a good player. Uh, you know, at one point regarded as one of the best in the world, and I had a massive offer from rugby union in 2001, which I went and actually met with Swansea, and you know, I met Graham Henry, and he actually paraded me out on on Ninian Park one day in front of. You know, for the Cardiff Rugby Union game, and I was thinking, like, this is not right. You know, and I felt like I was betraying the club almost. My heart was always at this club, and it was always at this club from day one. Twenty seconds and counting. Cardiff. You know, to finish my career there in 2010 when the stadium was shutting down. Things went well for me. I scored the last try, so I was in the record books of that, you know, of the league games. And then we played Huddersfield, and I scored the last try in the playoff game. So it was quite poignant. It was almost like, you know, the rugby gods were saying, "Well, we'll give you the last league try, and we'll also give you the last ever try at Nosey Road." So for me, that was the cherry on top. I was a fan and the fans knew that I was a fan and, and they knew how much this club meant to me and to get the statue I think against some of the people who I thought was the greatest players to ever play for this club and to come in front of them was, was amazing and you know for me it's just it keeps my name for my family alive forever and a day you know it's always going to be that's granddad's or great granddad's statue. Gareth, Kieran Cunningham, an incredible player, but part of an incredible St Helens team. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's been a bit of talk recently, hasn't there, with the current St Helens team about the greatest side in Super League history. Um, but any discussion there has to include that 2006 St Helens team. And, you know, around that era, generally, star-studded players. Kieran Cunningham was one of the best of them, wasn't he? And thought there was a fantastic picture last week. I think it was off the top of the, uh, the St Helens bus that went round parading the Challenge Cup. And Kieran Cunningham was on the side of the road, you know, clapping the team on. I just thought that was fantastic for a guy who'd, who's got a statue outside his own stadium. That was kind of how highly he was held in regard after his playing career. Then went on to coach the club. He's obviously away from the sport a bit now, but to get out on the street and clap the current team says everything about rugby league and everything about Kieran Cunningham, I think. Yeah, a fantastic player and a fantastic career. Let's turn our attentions then to the fixtures in this in the Betfred Super League this week these are the ones that as it stands are going ahead we obviously know from experience this season that that can change uh, quite quickly it starts off Wednesday night and this should be an absolute cracker Warrington versus Wigan it doesn't look like we're going to see George Williams in a Warrington shirt for the first time against his old club I wonder if that's they're just protecting him a little bit and trying to take some of the uh, pressure and a microscope off him against what would have been a huge story coming up against Wigan. But this, I actually can't call this game, Gary. Yeah, it's a fascinating one. I mean, just on Williams, I mean, it's a shame he's not playing. And um, I think the, the interruptions that Warrington have had because of COVID and not being able to train together has probably played a bit of a part in that. So Steve Price said he, he didn't feel he was just quite ready to slot in, but we're still gonna have a terrific game, aren't we? It's not that long ago since uh, Warrington were winning handsomely at Wigan. Uh, and since then, you know, Warrington, have, I'm not sure how often they played since then, but Wigan have won the last three games and kind of come out of their own slump. And so you've got a completely different prospect now. Uh, fascinating game. Uh, real test of whether Wigan are back on the up after those three wins. Um, and a test for Warrington as well, having had their time away from, from the field. How do they respond to that? Can they drop straight back into their form? Should be a cracker. And in such a disruptive season, it is almost difficult to get a gauge of where these clubs sit. But we are getting into that territory now where we are going to start talking about playoff places and, and, and where those teams sit in that structure. And this is a, a big opportunity for both teams to pick up what will be an important win against their rival. 
Absolutely, yeah. and again, it's not straightforward, is it, with the old points and win percentages? Uh, teams having played a different number of games. Uh, the bottom line is, I think every time you play, you've got to try and win, obviously. And uh, in terms of the playoffs, it could come down to points difference, win percentages. It could be tiny margins. So games like this will be really important. Uh, and I hope there's a bumper crowd on to see it because obviously the restrictions are lifted now as well in terms of how many people can go and watch it. Warrington hosting their first game since then. Uh, I hope the Halliwell Jones is, uh, is bouncing on Wednesday night. Yeah, that's a fantastic fixture to have straight out of the blocks after restrictions ease. On Thursday, quarter past six UK time, Catalans against Wakefield at Gilbert Brutus in Perpignan. And Catalans just continue to impress me week after week. They pulled it out of the fire a little bit last time out, but that is the difference for them this season, is that they seem to just have that steel about them and that ability to win from losing positions. Definitely, they're finding a way to win, aren't they? Whatever the performance. And I had a fairly long chat with Steve McNamara the other week. Uh, and he was saying the key was they've completely reduced the difference between the best and the worst performances. You know, it was always a trait of Catalans that could produce these fantastic displays and beat the best teams. And the week after, be miles off and lose to someone you would have thought they'd have won. They've closed the gap this year. They're a much more consistent team. We're not seeing any more of those 25, 30% performances. They're all minimum 70, 75%, 80%. And that means they are finding ways to win matches. They've been the most consistent team, haven't they? And they'll be deserved favourites in that game. Uh, Wakefield, having said that, though, Wakefield are a team that I really worried for at the beginning of the season, particularly on that early form. But they have turned it around and they've become a, a difficult side to beat. Yeah, they get their best team on the field. They can beat anyone. You know, that's that's not a an exaggerated statement. On their day, they're as good as anyone. They probably haven't, because of squad size and, and injuries and things, been able to have the consistency of some of the other teams. But the Catalans will be wary of them. Uh, and I'm sure they won't want to give another team a start like they did with Hulk KR at weekend. Well, also on Thursday, and if Twitter is to be believed, there are some question marks around this game. So by the time this goes out to where it's seven o'clock, this game may have been postponed, but I treat it as if it's not. Salford Red Devils versus Hull KR. And these two teams have a bit of a history of serving up really good games with Rugby League. Yeah, definitely. They're entertaining teams to watch, aren't they, both of them? And, and we saw Hull KR's potential. You know, they'd had a long break before Catalans, hadn't they? Came back in and, and 26-12 up at half-time. They looked, looked to be going on to win what would have been a massive match for them. They're playoff contenders, definitely. Uh, Salford are a bit off that race at the moment, aren't they? But they've shown signs over the last six weeks or so in certain games that the team that they can be under Richard Marshall uh, and with the way both teams play, uh, they like to attack, probably not defensively the best sides in the competition. So that, that could be a really entertaining contest. Tony Smith seems to have answered a lot of the questions that were around Hulk KR last season. I, they're probably a little bit less attacking and unpredictable this year, but a lot more steady and consistent. For Salford, Richard Marshall obviously taking over a new team is always going to take some time, and then probably even more so in a season as disrupted as this. But they do seem, as you said, that they're just starting to get the wheels turning a little bit. And if they can finish the season strong, then they'll feel like they, they might be on the front foot going forward. Yeah, definitely. I think it was always going to take time with Salford because Ian Watson had put such a huge imprint on that club over a long period of time that whoever came in, it wasn't going to be an overnight thing. Um, but I think you're seeing signs in the games of them playing the way Richard Marshall wants them to play. I know he's still concerned about the discipline and some of the discipline in defence, as well as things like yellow cards. Uh, that still needs to improve. But I think, generally speaking, they're going in the right direction and, and they've got some good players in that squad still. So should be a really interesting game. And then also on Thursday, this is a Sky game at quarter to eight. Hull FC versus Leeds Rhinos. Now, this is an interesting one because both teams have found consistency quite difficult to find this season. We've seen very good from both teams. We've seen distinctly average from both teams at times. And if you, we can just hope that the, we get the two best versions of these teams turn up and we should have a really good game in our hands. Yeah, if you get the best versions of both teams, you, you'll get one of the games of the season because, uh, again, there's, there's players across both teams there. Uh, I was really surprised by Hull Huddersfield and, and I'm certainly not underplaying how well Huddersfield played. I thought their young halfbacks were terrific last week. Uh, but Hull have been pretty consistent under Brett Hodgson. Even the games they've lost, um, they've been there or thereabouts. And, and I thought at, at times in that game, they looked a bit off it. Um, he mentioned afterwards whether they maybe underestimated the Giants. Um, perhaps they did. I think we'll see a reaction from Hull. Uh, and because of that, Leeds are going to have to step up. You know, they were very good at times, weren't they, against uh, 
Salford last weekend, uh, their attacks working fantastic in, in certain parts of the game. Uh, and if we do see the best of both teams, that is going to be a fantastic contest. Just before uh, we leave it for the evening, Gareth, there's obviously been a lot of talk this season. A lot of it's been quite difficult at times. It's been a disruptive season. We've had the World Cup news that's, that's struck in the last couple of weeks. And it does seem at the time there's more negative headlines than good at the moment. But what I would say is that if we can get through these next few weeks, and I think we will as a sport, I think we are setting up for a fantastic end of this Betfred Super League season, aren't we? Because Catalans are a real joker in the pack all of a sudden. There's a real chance that they could go all the way here. And I think Warrington as well will surprise a few teams. Inconsistent at times, but well in the mix. Saints and Wigan don't look as unbeatable and as, as dominant as they have done in the last few seasons. So there's a real opportunity for us to see something that we've not seen before. Absolutely. And then just before going on to that, you mentioned the negative stuff. And sometimes when you read social media, you, you wonder what the future is, don't you? But I think what it shows is people's passion in rugby league. And that's always been a strength of the sport. And that passion is absolutely still there. And as you say, it only needs a, a couple of weekends of fantastic games. And the players very rarely let us down, do they, when it comes to the right end of the season to change people's mindsets again. We, we had a terrific Challenge Cup final, a real contest where Castleford looked like they were going to win at half time. Saints came back into it and you pit the top teams in, in Super League against each other over a series of weeks. We're going to get exciting matches again. Like you said, there's so many different levels to what could happen in Super League between now and the end of the season. So many different storylines for us in the media to tell. Uh, and, and let's all get behind it because there will be some fantastic games. It is building towards a conclusion. Catalans is, is a great storyline in itself and there are several others We've got star players like George Williams going to be stepping back onto the field. Um, so let's hope the World Cup gets itself sorted out. Super League gets fully back on track. You know, hopefully we're hearing that COVID numbers are improving at the moment. You never want to jump the gun on that, do you? But hopefully it's less of a disruption to the competition and we can finish the year on a fantastic high. Yeah, I mean, like yourself, I've been involved in rugby league for a long time now. And if there's one thing I know is that it, rugby league will find a way and we should have a fantastic end to this season. Gareth, thank you for joining us. A lot to talk about on this show, some big issues this week. It's much appreciated for you coming on and much appreciated for you tuning in at home as well. We'll be back next week with more from The Last Tackle. <laughs>